Today we are going to try to prove the one of the most famous sampling theorems uh, in signal processing called the Shannon Nyquist sampling theorem. And as we talked about in the last lecture, the goal is that we are going to assume we have a signal G of T given. G A of T, which has some Fourier transform G A of J omega. And later in the lecture, we'll say that this is band limited to certain maximum frequency. And the idea is that you are sampling this signal at every T second. So you close the switch every capital T seconds and because of that you get the sequence GN and to prove the sampling theorem we need to basically talk about the main thing which is that when does sampling of G of T not lead to aliasing of frequencies where we had talked about earlier in the in the last class that aliasing is basically if you sample different frequencies and that's a function of their frequencies and the sampling duration their discrete time signal end up having the same for uh, the the same nature so you can't distinguish whether the frequency that you sampled was one versus the other. So we really want to address when does this G of n retain uh, all the information about G of t. So the goal in sampling theorem that we want to prove is when does, so an equivalent way of saying the above statement is when does G of n preserve all the information in GT. In general, G of G A of T is defined for every T. It has in sort of infinite amount of values associated with it, but you are reducing that to a to just the sampling sequence. And you are asking, when do you lose that information? When do you not lose information? Now, whether talking about this or talking about the frequency domain, it's the same question. So we can, instead of asking, when does G n preserve all the information, we can talk about when does the Fourier transforms preserve all the information. Whether we talk about a signal in time or frequency, it means the same thing. So we can equivalently say when does G of e to the j omega, which is the Fourier transform of Gn, preserve all the information in G of j omega, which is the continuous time Fourier transform of G A of t. <clears throat> okay. Now in general, you can just write down the Fourier transforms, of course. You have G A of J omega equals minus infinity to infinity G A of T e to the minus J omega T D omega. And G of e to the J omega, which is the discrete time Fourier transform, is simply n from minus infinity to infinity G of n e to the minus J omega n. But if we just stare at these two Fourier transforms, we it is not easy to figure out the relationship between the two or be able to address when do or do when do we not lose any information in going from the continuous time to the discrete time. So what we want to do is that we want to reduce this sampling operation, which is this is how it goes on in practice you implement that through using something called an analog to digital converter or ADC. We want to transform it into two-step mathematical operations to help us do the analysis, okay? And, and that two-step 
operation that we are going to do is purely for analytical purposes. In reality, you are not going to do that. So let's look at how we are going to transform that. We are going to say actually that this operation of sampling can equivalently be written as the following thing. We are given g a of t and we multiply it with another continuous time signal which we call p of t which is a periodic impulse train will define it and you get g p of t okay and after that you have a block of convert impulse train to sequence and you get gn back so they are equivalent operations mathematically physically you don't really do this operation although you try to mimic it using some sort of uh, sample and hold strategy. And once we start doing the analysis, you will see why we want to do this equivalent mathematical operation. So what is this P of T? This P of T is a periodic impulse train, which is written as N minus infinity to infinity, delta of T minus N T. So what does this look like? What this says is, so this is a periodic impulse train. You can see that it's a periodic function of period capital T. Okay. So you can check that any multiple, if you shift it by any multiple of T, you get back the same sequence. Pictorially, it looks like this. You have an impulse at t equal to 0, you have an impulse at t equal to t, you have an impulse at t equal to 2t, t equal to minus t, and t equal to minus 2t, and so forth. Okay. So what happens when we multiply my g a of t with g p of t? So this first operation that I am doing is multiplying my continuous time signal with a periodic impulse train. So I do G A of T P T and I just write it down G A of T summation n from minus infinity to infinity delta of T minus N T. Summation is linear, I take it inside g a of t delta of t minus n t. <clears throat> now at this stage you should all be knowing what happens when you multiply a function with an impulse. The only thing that is left is the function value at that at the location of the impulse. Right? So if I multiply g a of t with delta of t minus nt, what happens? I get the function value. So this impulse is located at t equal to, so this is an impulse at t equal to nt impulse. So I get the function value at g a of nt times delta of t minus nt. Effectively, I just get a, an impulse at the same location whose area is scaled by the function value at that location. So what I get is summation n from minus infinity to infinity g a of n t delta of t minus n t. Now remember that what is the definition of g n? The sequence, the discrete time sequence. The definition of g n is the function value every t second. So g n is nothing but g a of n t. Okay. So I can simply replace this. This is nothing but g n. This is the sampled value. Okay. 
So I can call it GN. And so what I get is summation n from minus infinity to infinity gn of delta of t minus nt. Okay. So now let's look at this two-step process that we talked about here. Okay. We have calculated the value of gp of t, which is given by this expression. We are interested in finding out when going from GA, the continuous time signal, to GN, the discrete time signal, leads to loss of information. We can equivalently ask when does going from GA of t to GP of t leads to loss of information? And when does going from this point to GN leads to loss of information? So let's look at the second block. If you are given GP of t, extracting GN is trivial. If you are given GP of t, how do you extract GN? You simply look at the area of each impulse. So if I am given GP of t, we can extract GN by looking at the area of each impulse. And similarly, if I am given GN, how can I recover GP? You just, if I am given if we are given GN, then Recovering GP is trivial. Why? Because you simply generate an impulse. And again, keep in mind, we are not interested in doing it in hardware. It's just a mathematical step. So how do you recover GP? You know that GP of T is simply you make impulses at every T seconds and the area of each impulse will be proportional to gn. So given gn, you simply say n equal to minus infinity to infinity, gn, and you just make the area of an impulse at nt. So the point is that this second operation, okay, this operation that you are looking at, this entails no loss of information. If I am given these impulses with different areas, I can recover a sequence. If I am given a sequence, I can recover these impulses. So if I am interested in finding out when I sample my continuous time signal, does it lead to loss of information? All I need to do is focus on does going from GA to GP lead to any loss of information, okay? And to do that, we'll be looking at the continuous time Fourier transform. So then our question of <coughs> does going from GA to GN lead to loss of information this is equivalent to just saying using our two-step mathematical abstraction does going from GA of T to GP of T lead to loss of information And again, whether we are asking about loss of information in time or we, whether we are asking about loss of information in frequency, it's the same concept. So we can now pose this as a frequency domain question. Does going from to the Fourier transform of GA of T is GAJ omega to the Fourier transform of GP will denote it by GPJ omega omega 
lead to loss of information. Okay. So that will be our goal. We'll be looking at the Fourier transform of GP J omega as a function of G A J omega and try to see whether we lose any information. Before we do that, I just want to pictorially show the first step of our mathematical abstraction. So remember we said that we want to write G A of T as a multiplication with P of T times, and this P of T is defined as this impulse train, delta of T minus N T, and we get G P of T. So pictorially, this is what it looks like. You're, you're multiplying your signal with an impulse train where the separation between two impulses is t seconds. Okay, It's a continuous time signal, t second separation, and the area of each of the impulses is unity. And then you multiply that with the signal g a of t. And when you do that, what is going to happen, the, you will get another impulse train because when you multiply an impulse with a continuous time function, you get back an impulse. Okay, So this is your, this G of T, this dotted line is your function. You are multiplying with impulses. What is going to happen is you are now going to get impulses and the, and the area of each impulse will be proportional to the function value at that location. So this impulse function that you see is g p of t, okay? where the impulses have positive area or negative area depending upon whether the function value was positive or negative. And if you want to now reconstruct, the second step was you want to go from g p of t and you just convert it into sequence into sequence to get gn, that is simply equivalent to you go to each impulse and say what is the area of that impulse. So this, you read the area here and that will be g of 2, okay, which is ga of 2t. So the area of the impulse at 2t will give you g2. The area of the impulse at t will give you g of 1. The area of the impulse at zero will give you g of zero, and so forth. Okay, so there is no loss of information in going from G P to G N. It's a, it's an invertible process, and we are really interested in figuring out that once you are left with these impulses with different with different areas up and down. You have lost all the information in between. Can you really recover the original signal? Okay. And that's what we'll focus on. So let's ask ourselves what is GP of J omega? The Fourier transform. GP of J omega is the Fourier transform of GP of T. Of course, it's a continuous time signal, so it's continuous time Fourier transform. And what is the definition of GP of T? It is simply multiplication of G of T with P of T, the impulse train. Now, what is the Fourier transform of multiplication of two time domain signals? So the Fourier transform of these is 1 over 2 pi, because we are doing radians, times Fourier transform of g of t convolved with Fourier transform of p of t. Okay. So that is 1 over 2 pi. Fourier transform of g of t or g a of t is, we call it g a j omega. We are not specifying anything further than that except that it exists and it's given by g a of j omega convolved with let's call the Fourier transform of the impulse train as p of j omega. Okay. So if we want to if we want to further talk about the Fourier transform we need to compute 
the Fourier transform of the impulse train. Now, the impulse train is a periodic function. And what do we know about periodic functions? So, since P of, P of T is periodic, it can be expressed in terms of Fourier series. So what the Fourier series form will use is the complex exponential. So what it means is that P of T can be written as an infinite summation of complex exponentials k equals to minus infinity to infinity, ck, and the complex exponentials have frequencies which are multiples of your, which are multiples of 1 over t, okay, where t is your period. So e to the j 2 pi over t k t. And I'll write that as summation k from minus infinity to infinity, c k e to the j k omega capital T t, where capital omega t is defined as 2 pi over t. So effectively, you can write p of t as an infinite summation of complex exponentials, and the frequency of each complex exponential is multiple of your sampling frequencies. So Remember this omega t, we called it the sampling frequency in radians per second. Okay. So the main challenge in Fourier series expansion is simply computing these Fourier series coefficients. For this form of the Fourier series, the Fourier series coefficients are simply given by 1 over t, and then you do integration over one period of the signal, minus t by 2 to t by 2. We don't want to go from 0 to t because of the impulsive nature of our signal. If we go from 0 to t, then we'll have to worry about the endpoints because we have an impulse at 0 and an impulse at t. So to avoid that issue, we'll do the integration from minus t by 2 to t by 2, in which case we'll only have one impulse in that period. So it's p of t e to the minus j k omega t t dt. So our p of t is an impulse at 0, at an impulse at t, minus t, and so forth. And we are now doing integration from minus t by 2 to t by 2, which means that the only thing that is within the integration range is one impulse. Right? Everything else is 0. So we get 1 over t minus t by 2 to t by 2 delta of t, because that's the impulse that we have between minus t by 2 and t by 2 e to the minus j k omega t t dt. <clears throat> and now we can use the sifting property. This, because this is a function of t, so because it's getting multiplied with delta t, we'll just write it at e to the minus j k omega t 0, which will be 1. Then we do the integration, and we'll get back 1. So all we'll see is 1 over t. Okay. So what this means is that a periodic impulse train can equivalently be written as, so original expression of that is, is the, this periodic delta, but we can also write it as 1 over t summation k from minus infinity to infinity e to the j k omega t t. Okay. And so if we are now interested in Fourier transform of P of T, we'll work with this version. Okay. 
to compute the Fourier transform. So the Fourier transform of P of T, which we call at P of J omega, is simply Fourier transform of this whole summation. Since Fourier transform is linear, we can take it inside the summation, so we get 1 over T. Summation k from minus infinity to infinity, Fourier transform of e to the j k omega t t. Now, we have to ask, what is the Fourier transform of this, of this complex sinusoid? So the Fourier transform of e to the j omega t, this is equal to 2 pi delta omega minus k omega t, which means if you were to plot it in the Fourier domain, what you get is an impulse at the location of k omega t, at omega equal to k omega t with an, with an area of 2 pi. Okay. This is zero. So this is the four-year plot. So if I plug that in, what I get is one over t summation k from minus infinity to infinity two pi delta of omega minus k omega t. And I can write that as 2 pi over t summation k equal to minus infinity to infinity delta of omega minus k omega t. So what it turns out is this is the Fourier transform p of j omega. If you compare p of t to p of j omega, what do you see? They have very similar form. They are both given by periodic repetition of impulses. So what it means is that if you are given a train of impulses in time domain, the Fourier transform of that is a train of impulses in frequency domain. So if you are given this train in time domain, minus t, zero, t, and, and the distance between them is t, the Fourier transform of that is another train with location, so you have zero. The, the amplitude of this train will be, the area of this train will be 2 pi over t. Then you get another impulse at omega t. So the distance between these impulses will be 2 pi over t. Okay? 2 omega t minus omega t, minus 2 omega t, and so forth. So this is, the Fourier transform of an impulse train is an impulse train. That's a way to remember with the right, of course, scalings of things. So now we can plug in what we had, what we were after was jp of j omega, which we had said was equal to 1 over 2 pi, J, G A of J omega convolved with P of J omega. We computed the Fourier transform of the impulse train, so we can now plug that in from this expression, this star equation. So we get 1 over 2 pi G A of J omega convolved with 2 pi over T summation k from minus infinity to infinity delta of omega minus k omega t. Now convolution is a linear operation, so I can take it inside the summation, and what I get is 2 pi cancels with 2 pi. I get 1 over t k from minus infinity to infinity g a of j omega convolution with delta of omega minus k omega t. Now at this point, this is an impulse. The domain is different. It's 
for its frequency domain, but it doesn't matter because the properties of impulse stay the same. We are convolving an impulse with another function. So remember this property of impulse that if I multiply f of x, some function, uh, convolve f of x with delta of x minus x naught, if I convolve a function with an impulse, what happens to the function? If you convolve a function with an impulse, you get back the same function, but now centered at the location of the impulse. Mathematically, what it means is you will get f of x minus x naught. So let's apply this principle here. You have a function. It's now of variable omega, but doesn't matter. The variable from, from the mathematical equations perspective, mathematics doesn't care if it's a variable of omega or x or whatever. So this is being convolved with an impulse which is at located at k omega t. So because of that, you will get back the same function, but now shifted to omega t, k omega t. Okay. So what it says is that gp of j omega equals 1 over t summation k from minus infinity to infinity ga of j omega minus k omega t. This is what happens when you take your signal and multiply it with the impulse strain. And this happens regardless of what g is. So this is does not depend upon whether g a of j omega is band limited. Okay. This is true always. So let's try to decipher what happens when you multiply your g a of t with p of t to get back g p of t. Okay. This is the Fourier representation of g p of t. Let's try to understand it. Let's try to decipher this, this equation because it has sort of three parts. Okay. So what happens? The first part is that you get this infinite summation and you are getting the same Fourier transform of your signal multiple times. That's the infinite summation. So what happens is that continuous time Fourier transform of g a of j omega gets converted to multiple copies. So this is being captured through this summation. This is this summation is effectively this point one. Right? You are getting multiple copies of your original Fourier transform. Now this 1 over t is the second point, which is that each copy is being scaled by 1 over t. Okay. And the third is this part. which is that each copy of g a of j omega is shifted to locations k omega t. Okay. So the effect of doing this multiplication with the periodic train of impulses is in frequency domain you are getting multiple copies of your Fourier transform 
Each copy is getting scaled by 1 over t, and each copy is being shifted to a location at a multiple of your sampling frequency. Remember, omega t is your sampling frequency. Okay. So let's try to look at it pictorially, what is happening in the frequency domain when you are doing this operation. You are given in the frequency domain, what we are given is that GP of J omega, I'm just writing the previous equation, is simply GA of J omega convolved with P of J omega time divided by 2 pi. Okay. So this is my GA of J omega, this is my P of J omega, and we computed, so this is actually a typo, this should be 2 pi by t. Okay. Each of these impulses is 2 pi by t. So you are convolving this function, and this function is being the author has drawn it in a in a fashion that it is actually not even so that he can show you pictorially the difference but and he has drawn it as a band limited signal so the bandwidth of this is omega m radians so you are convolving this with this impulse train what is happening this thing gets shifted to each of these locations of the impulses. That's what is what convolution with an impulse does. So what happens is that the same Fourier transform gets shifted at zero and it also gets shifted at the location of this second impulse so it gets shifted at pi over t and it gets shifted at 2 omega t minus omega t and since the fact this was 1 this was 2 pi over t so the factor we get is 1 over t okay so those are the three operations that are happening for the Fourier transform GP of J omega we get multiple copies of my Fourier transform each of the copies get scaled by 1 over t each of the copies gets shifted to omega t 2 omega t minus omega t is 0 and so forth. Okay. Now we are interested in the question when does GP of J omega preserve information in GA of J omega or effectively when can you recover your original Fourier transform from this Fourier transform that you have available? Because if you can recover the Fourier transform, then that means you can recover the time domain signal. They are one and the same thing. So <clears throat> for that, what we need to make sure is that this GP of J omega Actually, you can, if you want to heuristically think of it, you can at least see the original functions for your transform in this figure. Okay. Or there is no corruption of different copies. The only way that you will lose information is actually if these different copies were to overlap with each other. If they did not overlap with each other, then you can see that, them clearly. And you can recover them, we'll come to that later. So, if you want to compute under what conditions the Fourier transform of GP of, J, uh, GP of T contains all the information, we need two conditions. The first condition is that we say G A of J omega or equivalently G A of T is band limited to some frequency omega m radians per second which is shown in this figure. Okay, The maximum frequency on the positive and the negative side is omega m. So you require the band limited assumption but the second condition you need is 
that this these different copies don't overlap with each other and you can focus on any one of the copies the answer will be the same so when do these copies don't overlap with each other so if this copy is at omega t then this point is omega t minus omega m and this point is omega m so let's look at just the right side of when there is no overlap Well, for that to happen, you better make sure that the left end of the second copy is not merging with the right end of the copy at centered at zero. Okay. So what this means is that you need to make sure that omega t minus omega m, this part is bigger than omega m. And that equivalently means that omega t is bigger than 2 omega m. Okay. So this is the, and sometimes you also put the equality if they are really hitting 0 or, or you don't really care about the edges. So this is the condition to ensure you don't have an overlap of different copies. You can verify the same thing here. What is the value of this edge? Minus omega t plus omega m. And this edge is minus omega m. And the goal is that minus omega t plus omega m remains on the left side of minus omega m. So that is less than minus omega m. Which again implies that omega t is bigger than to omega m. Okay. You can actually look at any other copies and you will get the same condition. If you want to make sure that there is no overlap of different copies, then you need to make sure that this condition is satisfied. So condition to ensure <coughs> that GP of t contains all the information in GA of t is that omega t is bigger than or equal to 2 omega m. The way you say that is that the sampling frequency is at least twice the maximum frequency. So the bandwidth essentially tells us what is the maximum frequency present in the signal. Is at least twice the maximum frequency in the signal. If that condition is satisfied, then you are guaranteed that you can recover your original signal from your, the samples of the signal. Because from the samples, you can construct GP of T. And from the GP of T, we see the original signal Fourier transform. So by doing a simple filtering operation, which we'll see later, we can recover the original signal. So now let's look at the case when this condition is not satisfied. So omega t is actually less than 2 omega m. What happens then? Well, what we will have is that these different copies that are given in this summation will overlap with each other and you can no longer see the original signal Fourier transform inside your the Fourier transform of GP of T. Okay. 
So here is an example where actually your omega t minus omega m is less than omega m, which effectively means that omega t is less than 2 omega m. What happens here is that you have different copies overlapping with each other. So these dotted lines are the overlapped copies, and then you add them all up. Right? So when you add them all up, what you get is this figure. And if you compare it to now your original Fourier transform, which was, which is given here, you can see that we can no longer see that same figure in this new Fourier transform expression. So effectively, if you can't see that same Fourier transform, if you can't see the same frequency response in your original, in, in your, in the Fourier transform of GP of T, you can't recover it. Okay. Another way of looking at it will be, uh, I'll draw a simpler picture, which might be easier. If my, let's say my G A of J omega was this picture, omega M minus omega M, okay, and I don't satisfy the this condition, which we'll later see is called the Nyquist criterion, then the Fourier transform I get later will be I will have a copy at zero. I will have a copy at omega t. But there will be overlap of these copies. So this will be at omega t minus omega t. And my entire sum will be my sum will look like this. Now, I get this figure if I sample this. On the other hand, if I were to actually have a Fourier transform, I had a signal which had a Fourier transform like this, okay, up to this point. Let's call this G A prime J omega. And if you were to do this exercise, you will get back the same figure. So basically what is happening is that you have two signals now whose Fourier transform is different. If signals have different Fourier transform, then they are different signals. But when you look at GP of J omega, you are getting the same Fourier transform. So you have no way of knowing whether the original signal was this or whether the original signal was G A of J omega. Okay. It again goes back to the same concept of aliasing or the example that we had seen for these uh, pure sinusoids of cosine, these different frequencies example that we have looked at in the last lecture. So indeed, if you don't satisfy this condition of twice, if your sampling frequency is not twice the maximum frequency in your signal, then you cannot recover your original signal. So using all the heuristics and the figures and, and mathematics, what we have essentially shown is what is known as the Shannon-Nyquist sampling theorem. This theorem goes by other names too. Um, there are there are some Russian contributions to it also, and uh, it's just that Shannon Nyquist is the most commonly used uh, word for this theorem. Um, what the Shannon Nyquist sampling theorem says is is the crux of what we have been discussing so far, which is that if your signal is band limited, and if you sample such that your sampling frequency is at least twice the bandwidth, then you are guaranteed that the samples of the signal can be used to reconstruct the original signal. Okay. So let's state the theorem, which is that assume GA of T 
is a band limited signal and we'll write the bandwidth so it means that GA of J omega equal to zero for all omega greater than or equal to omega m. Okay, We talked about earlier some of the common examples of band limited signals are voice signal, music signal, ECG signals, seismic data and so forth. If this is the case then GA of t can be uniquely reconstructed from its samples. The samples are given by Gn equals to Ga of nt okay. as long as the following condition holds, which is that 2 pi over t, which is the definition of my sampling frequency in radians, is greater than or equal to 2 omega m. Okay. As long as this condition holds, you are guaranteed that you can recover the original signal. So an example of that will be for example, if you are recording my voice, we talked about earlier voice, we can approximate it to be band limited to 3.4 kilohertz. Okay. If it's 3.4 kilohertz, then that means that your sampling frequency, omega t, has to be bigger than or equal to 2 times 3.4 kilo times 2 pi. Okay or in, in hertz, my sampling frequency has to be bigger than or equal to 6.8 kilohertz. Okay. Now, in real world, voice, if you are just interested in communicating, is actually sampled at 8 is typically taken to be 8 kilohertz for voice. What it means is that you want to, if you are recording my voice, you want to make sure that you record 8,000 samples of my speech per second. Okay. You have to record every one over 8,000 seconds, you have to take a sample. If you don't, then you will lose critical information about what I'm saying. Similarly, for music, CD quality music, the assumption is that 20 kilohertz is the right range because human ears can't distinguish more than 20 kilohertz anyways. Okay? So what this means is that you need FT to be at least bigger than 40 kilohertz. So the higher the maximum frequency, the more frequently you need to sample that signal. If you want to capture music up to 20 kilohertz, you need to make sure that every second you capture at least 40,000 samples per second. Or every one over 40,000 seconds, you capture a new sample. Okay? In real world, you always give yourself some margin because of imper imperfections and other things that we'll talk about later. FT is taken to be 44.1 kilohertz. Okay. So if you look at CDs, you will see 44.1 kilohertz sampling written there. <clears throat> Now there are some terminologies associated with with the sampling theorem. This is called Nyquist criterion. The condition that your sampling frequency is at least twice the maximum frequency that's called Nyquist criterion. Okay. 
<clears throat> you can write it. So there are two ways of looking at the Nyquist sampling theorem. One is I have a maximum frequency in my signal. What is the sampling frequency I need? And the answer is you need twice of that as the sampling frequency. The other way of looking at it is that you have a for a fixed sampling frequency omega t if my sampling frequency is fixed then you can ask the question what is the maximum frequency you can handle so for a fixed sampling frequency the maximum frequency you can handle is omega t over 2 right we can handle at at best a frequency of omega t over 2 okay because otherwise you will not satisfy this nyquist criterion so omega t over 2 is often called the nyquist frequency or it's also called the folding frequency or it's called the cutoff frequency okay so if we if i take the example of the voice sampling for a sampling frequency of 8 kilohertz my cutoff frequency is 4 kilohertz my signal cannot have anything above 4 kilohertz okay it's just another way of saying the same theorem. You can either say, my maximum frequency is this, what's the least sampling frequency I need? Or you can say, my sampling frequency is this, what's the maximum frequency of the signal I can handle? Okay. Um, <clears throat> 2 omega m is the term that is used is Nyquist rate. Other terminologies that are used are in relation to, so if omega t is bigger than 2 omega m, strictly bigger, then we say that we are doing oversampling. What it means is that we are sampling more than the required rate. And in real world, we always do oversample because our signals are not strictly band limited. And when we make them band limited, we make them using filters which may not have very sharp cutoffs. So that is why you see in the real world for, for voice, we, have, we are doing oversampling. Instead of 6.8 kilohertz, we are doing 8 kilohertz. For music, instead of doing 40 kilohertz, we are doing 44.1 kilohertz. So in real world, we are always doing oversampling. If omega t equals to 2 omega m, then this is called critical sampling. And if omega t is less than 2 omega m, which means we are losing information, it is called undersampling. So as an engineer, whenever you are asked, that here is a continuous signal and why don't you record it inside some sort of a digital device the first question you have to ask is is the signal band limited if the signal is band limited what is the maximum frequency of that signal and then I must sample that signal at twice that maximum frequency okay now we have talked about the, the sampling theorem. We have sort of argued it using the Fourier transform of that GP of T. The remaining question that we want to address in the coming lectures is, are the following. The first question we want to address is, we have the samples available now. How do we reconstruct 
g a of t from its samples. So, so forth, we have only talked about when do we not lose information and we just stated the theorem because of that. We said since we can see the, the Fourier transform of the original signal within this big picture, we haven't lost any information, but how do we really recover that information now? So that's called reconstruction. The second question we want to address is what happens when the Nyquist criterion is not satisfied. And what happens is what's called aliasing or frequency folding effectively higher frequencies appear as lower frequencies in your reconstructed signal and you want to avoid that. So the third question we want to look at is how to prevent adverse effects of aliasing <clears throat> even if we cannot increase the sampling rate. So one way to avoid aliasing is just increase the sampling rate. But what if we cannot? Right? In reality, if you analyze, analyze any person's speech, it's not actually band limited to 3.4 kilohertz. It's intelligible up to 3.4 kilohertz, but in reality, it's not band limited. And we talked about earlier, that's why many times when people speak on the phone you say well you sound different than in real life okay so how to prevent adverse effects of aliasing even if the sampling frequency cannot be increased and the answer lies in what's called anti-aliasing filter which is simply before you sample you actually make it band limited by filtering in the continuous domain and then the most important part will be which we'll uh, talk about only later is the relationship between the continuous time Fourier transform of G A of T and the discrete time Fourier transform of G of N. Okay. Why do we want to understand that relationship? Because that's where the real digital processing lies. Because what is going to happen in real world is someone will say here is a signal, let's say my voice, and you say I want you to cancel or, or damp all the frequencies in my voice between 2 kilohertz and 2.5 kilohertz. Now that statement is a continuous time statement. But you are going to do the processing inside MATLAB. And, in, and that means you are going to do it in discrete time. And what are the frequencies in discrete time? They are between minus pi and pi. So 2 kilohertz does not make sense in discrete time, but you need to be able to translate what does 2 kilohertz in continuous time mean in discrete time. And to answer that question, we have to relate the Fourier transform of a continuous signal to the Fourier transform of its samples. So those are the four questions we'll try to address in the next coming lectures.